but I'm gonna get started. Hello and welcome. I'm Nellie Stansbury, Denison Consulting's Marketing Specialist. I'm very happy to welcome you from around the world to Denison's first webinar in our Digital Culture Series. To get started, um, please test the functionality of the questions and answers feature on the webinar by sharing where in the world you are joining us from. Our last research and webinar series focused on organizational resilience throughout the pandemic. Today, we will explore leadership practices for a virtual environment, the impact COVID-19 has had on organizational leaders, and some of the resources and services Denison has developed to best support leaders during times of crisis. I want to now introduce our panelists. Joining us today are Brian Atkins and Valerie Thomas. Brian is the CEO and a partner of Denison Consulting. He has worked with clients to build high performance cultures and leaders for over 20 years. Today, Brian supports many of our key clients and continues our tradition of linking thought leadership and practical insight for maximum impact. Valerie is a senior consultant and executive coach at Denison Consulting. She has over 20 years of experience working for Fortune 100 companies in human resources and organizational development. Her experience managing large scale change initiatives, coupled with her leadership coaching and performance management expertise, contributes to her success in leading companies through their transformational culture efforts. While many of you are likely familiar with Denison, I'd like to briefly overview who we are and what we do. Denison Consulting is a firm focused on large-scale culture transformation and leadership development, headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with a European office based out of Zurich, Switzerland. Our global reach has allowed us to do work in over 50 countries and to develop diverse research and diagnostics. Our mission is to improve organizational performance by developing corporate culture and leadership. Our global team of experts uses our set of diagnostic assessments rooted in research to provide transformation services to our clients. Next, I'd like to overview our resilience assessment research and our virtual coaching experience as foundations of today's discussion. From March through July 2020, Denison offered a pro bono resilience assessment to better understand the impact of the pandemic on organizations, people, and performance. We worked with companies from a variety of industries and we established a benchmark of 40 organizations and over 15,000 respondents. Denison learned a lot about the challenges organizations have faced during the pandemic with our resilience research. Our research also prompted us to start thinking about the implications for leaders during this time. For the last 30 years, Denison has provided leadership development coaching and services. In the last year alone, we provided virtual coaching for over 2,000 global leaders, including several projects with leaders during the pandemic. Our research and extensive coaching experience has shown us that both organizations and leaders have had to adapt their beliefs and assumptions about leadership, culture, and the work environment throughout this time of crisis. Lastly, before I turn the presentation over to Valerie, I'd like to share what we will cover in today's session. COVID-19 has created new unforeseen challenges for organizations and leaders working virtually for the first time, but the pandemic has also highlighted existing tensions within organizations. Today, Brian and Valerie will focus on what we know about leading in a virtual environment and what we've learned during the pandemic, a framework for optimal organizational results, leadership practices in a digital environment, common leadership pitfalls and strategies for improvement, how leaders can get crucial feedback during times of crisis, and the links between organizational culture and leaders. While Brian and Valerie present today, please utilize the Q&A function. I'll be monitoring your questions and comments throughout and looking for themes that we can discuss at the end of the webinar when we've dedicated some time to answer all your questions. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Valerie to take over and share her findings with us. Great, thank you, Nellie. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today. You know, we, part of what we want to share with you today is, you know, as Nellie mentioned, we've been coaching 
both over the last several years, um, but also predominantly in this time of, of change and the pandemic. So today is about sharing with all of you what we know and what we have learned specifically in this virtual environment and through this troubling times that um, organizations are dealing and facing with. So some of the, the key things that we have learned, you know, starting with, you know, the digital and virtual environment is new for some and for many, quite honestly, and a, a pretty sudden change. So we were kind of jolted into this working virtually uh, together. And as leaders, we also are being tested in many, many ways. Um, some ways in which we have been tested before, and now in this virtual environment, we continue to be tested. Um, and, you know, aside from the virtual environment, you know, we are noticing that and we're hearing from our clients that the workforce is rapidly changing. And so that adds just a, a stronger, uh, bigger complexity that organizations and leaders have to deal with. Uh, so some examples of that is, you know, the new generation entering the workforce and how do we virtually onboard folks so that they feel a strong connection commitment early on to the organization and to their, their team as well as people leaving the organization. A lot of retirements, we're hearing, you know, some companies are looking at huge retirement numbers. And so they're having to, you know, focus on, you know, being able to retain some of that, help those leaders, you know, leave their legacy behind, articulate what that legacy is and leave the organization with the knowledge uh, to set them up for success, uh, especially during the, these challenging times. Uh, the other piece of this, as Brian mentioned, there's a lot of external pressures <laughs> on companies today, and leaders can get forced to slip back into this survival mode, and which when we're in survival mode, we tend to draw from our default, our default leadership tendencies uh, that are most comfortable, and most often those are not as effective as they need to be. Uh, leadership within virtual teams, you know, is, is critically important and they play such a central role in the effectiveness of that virtual team, especially when teams are having to, to deal with obstacles, uh, solve problems, and ultimately help the organization through some of these troubling times and the challenges that they're facing. Denison, as you know, or hopefully will know after today's call, we are very deeply rooted. All of our tools, all of our um, solutions, our diagnostics are deeply rooted in research. <clears throat> so we would be remiss if we didn't share some of that research. And just to note, Valerie, I think we've lost the slides, so we might need to okay. reshare. Our technical part of the challenges in the virtual environment is technology. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you. Sorry for that pause there. Um, so I, as I was saying, you know, Denison, one of our biggest differentiators is our research, um, sound research in both our solutions and our consulting practice, but also in the diagnostics um, aspect of it. We have a dedicated research team um, and we would be remiss if we didn't share some research around virtual teams. So what you're seeing here on the screen is the research out there. And what you will see is a lot of the, the research um, goes back in time. However, they're critically important in virtual teams as well, um, and, and especially in times of such challenges. You know, trust comes up over and over and over again as we coach leaders, um, trust, and how do we build trust and maintain the trust that we have in this new virtual environment? So communication is key. Being, as all of us, being timely with our responses and having that openness to giving and receiving feedback. Um, trust, you know, is foundational to teamwork and it is based on perceptions of others, um, our perceptions of others and their ability uh, to get results to knowledge share, to transfer that information and be diverse and inclusive throughout that process. The last piece here, you know, again, we continue to hear it um, show up with our clients 
And you know, the virtual environment you know, de de definitely emphasizes the need for members to feel included um, as equal and connected. And that helps to improve cooperation and conflict management. Um, so it's definitely when people are establishing you know, good communications, clarity around goals, we do see an increase of cohesion and performance um, through teamwork. So all of this research, all of our experience coaching leaders, you know, we come back to um, our framework of optimal results. We all want to get the best results. We want our organizations to be successful and achieve their vision. So we often use this framework when coaching leaders, and it starts with our model. And our model is deeply rooted in research at looking at business performance and the impact culture has, leaders have. And so if you see in the center of our model that beliefs and assumptions, and beliefs and, beliefs and assumptions are core to an organization as well as to an individual. We have collective beliefs um, as an organization, and we have individual beliefs. And those beliefs drive actions, behaviors. They sometimes show up as habits within the organization, practices in the organization, routines, and those practices, those actions, behaviors, end up getting you your results. And as we know, optimal results aren't always what we get. <laughs> so this model helps you understand that if you're not getting the results that you want, you have to go back to that belief and that assumption that you're to, to be able to drive more optimal results, different actions, different behaviors. Um, some organizations kind of get stuck in what I call a circular eddy, and they are looking at their results, and they're constantly going back to changing their actions and behaviors. And I use the example of that's, you know, the definition of insanity when you're not getting the results, and you just keep going back and forth, and your your results don't change. The reason why that is, is because we haven't uncovered those beliefs and assumptions. So what does this look like? What are some examples of some beliefs, assumptions people might have? These are actually beliefs that I'm gonna share with you that I've heard from leaders in the last four months. So this is pretty critical right now in, in the pandemic and navigating through this environment. So one example is, as a leader, you might have a belief that knowledge is power. So what actions, what behaviors does that belief drive? Well, leaders withhold information. They hold it tightly to their chest. And you can imagine the impact that can have when you have people leaving the organization through retirement. That knowledge transfer is so critical. It's also so critical on the onboarding process, making sure people are clear and aligned. So that belief can drive low levels of, of sharing of information, which as a result, will delay results and also impact the level of engagement and for new employees, their level of commitment to the new organization that they've joined. And for leaders that are exiting and, and retiring, their willingness to, to leave the organization in a better place. So let's, let's talk about a couple more examples just to help you use this framework. <clears throat> so another belief I continue to hear, we continue to hear, is giving feedback takes too much time, just too much time. I don't have time in my day to be able to give feedback. So it's not about leaders thinking it's not important. They're really struggling with finding the time in their day to be able to give feedback. So what, what do they do? They just don't do it. <laughs> they just don't find the time. They don't give the feedback. And the result is people feel a lack of trust with that leader. They're not get, they, they don't know where they are or where they stand with that leader. And that all ultimately demotivates employees. All right, so I've got one more example. Again, this is a framework that we are hoping that you take away as a tool in your toolbox to be able to kind of think about your own individual beliefs and assumptions and, and actions and, and results. So one more common leadership practice that we hear, a belief that we hear is strong work ethic means working 24 seven. So 
in our previous webinar, some of you may have attended that one, we focused on work-life balance and some key activities, key things to be thinking about to help with employees during this time. So if you can imagine if my belief is a strong work ethic means I'm working 24 seven, I'm expecting others to do that as well. So we're not modeling it, right? We're not modeling work-life balance and we're also not encouraging it and allowing people that space and time uh, to kind of create what that looks like for them. And ultimately the result is burnout. Employees are burnt out. They feel like they've gone the extra mile, they can't do it. Um, anymore and it also they lose passion for the work that they do and also commitment to the organization um, so really key things and again these are things that i heard while coaching through the the pandemic so as nelly mentioned we want to kind of emphasize some of the, the pitfalls leaders have found themselves in um, over the years but also you know during this uh, challenging time and one, the first one there is assuming as a leader that your colleagues, your direct reports, your peers, your direct, your, your boss have what they need in this new environment. Again, the clarity on goals and the feedback is so critically important. And we can just make that assumption um, that people are clear and aligned. You know, those leaders that struggled with delegation and, you know, have a habit of micromanaging um can will erode trust unintentionally so in this time of virtual um, environment you know that those old habits of micromanaging will tend to show up and have been showing up for leaders uh, some leaders are reverting to virtual meetings to ensure people are being productive so they're not able to see them working in the office so an assumption is that they're not working, so they have to see them. And so they'll use virtual meetings to manage and making sure people are actually doing their work. Um, some leaders I've heard are focused more um, on some of the lower performers and maybe not engaging the high performance enough. So traditionally that you know, low performer uh, took a lot of that leader's time and now since they can't see them, you know, now they're really focused on helping uh, that particular performer. And, you know, what we've learned is you need a balance. You know, you can quickly disengage your high performers by not giving them feedback in the same amount of time and, and care. Um, some leaders have a task focus strength and overuse strength <laughs> in some cases. And again, being more task focused and reverting to, to taking over, uh, especially when you're not getting the results from your employees as fast as you would like to. So being able to dial back that overuse strength of kind of taking over um, and being task oriented. You know, we also are hearing that, you know, organizations are postponing key initiatives, things like employee development, onboarding processes, uh, knowledge transfer um, <clears throat> initiatives um, instead of finding ways to do them virtually. And so we, what we want to overemphasize is that a lot of your critical initiatives can, can take on a new view through that virtual lens. It's just kind of getting clear on what that could look like and getting the technology um, to support you in that. So those are some common pitfalls. Uh, with that, again, our, our beliefs and our assumptions drive behaviors, practices, and get us our results. So what are some of the ineffective digital practices, right? So these are, again, things that we have heard from leaders and have been coaching leaders uh, to start to minimize and be aware of. So again, scheduling those excessive non-critical meetings just to be managing performance, making sure people are working. Um, ineffective meeting routines. So that was something, you know, we have heard before. A lot of companies struggle with meeting structure and discipline. In the virtual environment, I feel like it has been just exasperated. So again, really having clear um, agendas and, you know, leaving every meeting with some to-do actions. Uh, postponing development and then individual de development plans. You know, I think Traditionally, the first thing when companies are struggling, the first thing to go is training and development, right? Which is really ironic because that's 
really what you need <laughs> in order to move the, the business forward is to have the, the level of capabilities within the organization for both current and future needs. The other big thing that we're realizing with organizations is that they're still stuck in driving those long-term goals. And a lot of businesses today, sadly, are in survival mode. They're trying to um, stay in business. And so what we've noticed and helped coach organizations is not to completely lose sight of your long-term, but for those long-term goals, create some near-term, what we call sprint goals. Um, it really does help. To, to focus um, everybody's attention on the most critical things that need to be taken care of. Functional areas, departments continue to work in silos. You know, again, Brian was on the last webinar. We he talked about court, the importance of coordination and integration, breaking down those silos, building those key stakeholder relationships. I think this is really um, ex exasperated in the virtual environment as well. Um, so people aren't able to just walk by somebody's desk <laughs> and have a conversation. They're not able to, you know, gather around a water cooler and share. Um, so criticalness of that is, is huge right now in the virtual environment as well. And we're seeing people struggle. Uh, addressing conflict without a clear problem or root cause. You know, it, in the virtual environment, what we're seeing is it tends to be just a, an open dialogue <laughs> for opinions and assumptions, and they're not able to really focus in on what the actual problem is. And then eliminating after action reviews. So that is, again, kind of from a virtual perspective, we still need to have those um, after action reviews so that we can understand and learn from our mistakes. So what I've seen is, you know, we're not necessarily creating that space in the virtual environment. So you might be asking yourself, okay, Valerie, you've told us all the pitfalls, you're telling us about the ineffective digital practices, what can we do? So here's what are some effective digital practices. Here are the things that we have, and you know, some of these are things leaders have brought to us as we're coaching um, and what they're focused on. So the first and foremost, Conducting regular emotional checking in with people. This is stressful. We've got people who are homeschooling their kids. We've got people who are taking care of elderly or older family members while trying to maintain their job. So, you know, that emotional connection is really, really critical, as well as checking in on work related expectations and goals. Um, again, those, those sprint goals. You know, Hosting many team events um, to maintain social connectivity. Got a lot of op options in terms of how to create that connectedness. You know, I think organizations can get really creative and have a lot of fun with this, but it also, you know, again, we're kind of losing the, the great interactions on the elevator or in the stairwell or, you know, walking by each other's desks. So how do we create that in the, in the virtual environment? Because social connectivity is really critical. Communicating, clarifying goals. Again, those sprint goals are, are gonna really help you, especially when you're trying to survive and you're trying to keep your business afloat. So really, and it allows employees to really be focused on the right actions and not, you know, what I have seen is there's so many priorities hitting folks, they're, they're getting overwhelmed. And so really trying to, to create some, a laser focus sprint goal is really critically important. Continue coaching and development programs. Uh, especially those of you who have maybe done a 360 within the last year, you know, don't, don't avoid or, or lose momentum in, in your development plan. Keep it top of mind, you know, dust it off and really create some programs within virtual environments. There's quite a few companies that are, you know, embarking on that right now that, you know, we're here to help and, you know, the, Coaching and development doesn't have to end just because we're not in a classroom together, uh, traditional learning and development um, environment. Development plans are even more now critical than before. Um, and with those development plans, we want to ensure that they are linked to team goals as well as organizational goals. Again, really focused on the right things that are going to move the organization forward. Um, 
identifying those interdependencies between and within teams. So we use the language give and get um, often. And you probably remember that if you attended the webinar. Um, and what we mean by that is really understanding what is it from a department, from an individual, from a team, um, what is it that we need to give each other and what do we need to get from? And so really providing that clarity and also sharing what you're responsible for, what your goals are. So people have a clear sense um, and there's a clear alignment around goals across the functional areas. You know, engaging in healthy conflict to solve problems. You know, again, conflict is not easy. Some organizations are pretty conflict avoidant. And if that is the case, being virtual is gonna be really, really difficult to handle uh, conflict. So, you know, really coming from a place of root cause not looking at placing blame in, uh, on any one individual, but really unpacking what is the actual problem itself and then coming up with solutions. You know, celebrating successes and learning from failures. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times this comes up both from a leadership perspective as well as uh, from a culture perspective. You know, I think oftentimes successes, you know, we don't spend enough time learning from them and applying that learning. We almost take them for granted. Um, similarly, from a leadership perspective, a lot, of, a lot of leaders are uncomfortable with that positive, positive you know, outcomes. And so they, they're happy about them, but they don't wanna spend enough time on them. Um, they much rather go fix something that's wrong or fix you know, a, a development area for themselves. So both are important and we both uh, they both need the uh, same amount of attention and coming from a, that learning perspective is, is key. So those are some effective digital practices that we have found, again, both from our coaching as well as uh, from leaders themselves um, throughout um, our coaching experience. So finally, I just want to offer you some tips to consider, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, use that framework for optimal, optimal results. Reflect on your beliefs and assumptions. Leaders learn best through reflection. That can take many different forms. Some, you know, use a journal. Others will just, you know, use post-it notes. But really taking the time to really reflect, understand what those beliefs and assumptions are, and are they driving the actions that you need to uh, get the results that you want. <clears throat> so beliefs around how you delegate, beliefs around your ability to share information, beliefs around trust, what does that look like for you? Um, and then how you react to successes and failures. With that reflection, create a development plan, you know, based on these new behaviors, or maybe they're behaviors that you tried out in the past, but with this pandemic and with all the challenges, we've kind of reverted back to old habits. So. They could be new, but they could be ones that you've tried out before and you just haven't built a strong enough muscle. Um, and create that mindful of what those behaviors look like in the virtual environment. And I know nobody likes meetings and we have a ton of them, we've, we've heard that, but I do ask and I offer this as one of the most impactful things that you can do today. <laughs> Start with 15 minute check-ins just 15 minutes just to give each other the feedback that you want to share in terms of appreciative and constructive feedback and do that with your direct reports with your peers and and with your boss again staying connected staying clear and aligned on what your responsibilities are your goals the sprint goals and and, and emotionally as well Model and encourage work-life balance. I, I can't tell you enough how often it comes up. And the research does show that people are, when working from home, are more productive. They're actually having a hard time turning work off. And that's why this balance is so critically important. And so really, as leaders, modeling that, encouraging that, and having the dialogue to help others kind of figure out what does that look like. And lastly, Give and get feedback. Feedback is, if you haven't you know, noticed, that's a theme throughout this. It's so critically important. And my hope is that you walk away from this 
energized around creating a feedback mechanism. And um, I'm going to turn it over here to Brian because he's going to take us even deeper into that, the importance of giving and receiving feedback. So thank you for your attention and I'll turn it over to Brian. Yeah, thanks Valerie. Uh, you know, as, as we start talking about all of the challenges that leaders face, uh, I thought I'd start out with a uh, bit of a positive note here. I think when we're talking about beliefs and assumptions, I think one of the beliefs and assumptions that some of us might have is that proximity to our people makes for a more effective leader. And the research actually suggests that quite often leaders who are not co-located with their team members are often viewed as being more competent and more effective. There are exceptions to that. Certainly uh, the more hierarchical type organizations are an exception. Uh, <clears throat> maybe there's a little bit of absence makes the heart grow fonder uh, captured here. Uh, so there is, you know, there, there is uh, good indications that you can be effective. And one of the things that I think Valerie's uh, touched on quite a bit here is a, a lot of people uh, have shown, though, that virtual environments can be, uh, the way I've heard it described, one person described it as virtual environments are often stripped of the information richness that's there. Uh, and part of that information is feedback. And so we know that leaders today, as we've been working through the pandemic and other challenges, are asking, how am I doing in this environment? Uh, how do I get the feedback I need when a lot of the conversations are virtual and a bit more transactional? We're not opening ourselves up for deeper conversations. Uh, how do I need to adapt my own leadership beliefs and assumptions in response to some of these new ways of working? And, and how do I build those trusting relationships and deliver results when I have less direct, less face-to-face -face interaction and potential oversight? So we know those are some of the, the questions leaders are asking of themselves. We also know that employees during this time and in virtual settings uh, going back uh, even before the pandemic, what they're looking for, they're looking for leaders who are listening, uh, that are responsive to some of their concerns and issues. We heard this uh, loud and clear in some of our resilience uh, survey work that we did that employees wanna make sure their voice is being heard in an organization. They want to make sure that leaders are being sensitive, uh, empathetic to their home situations, their schedules, um, that their, again, their opinions are being respected and understood, and that they're getting regular feedback as well about their performance, about the projects they're working on, their specific deliverables that they're supposed to uh, achieve. So feedback is more important than ever. We've worked very hard at Denison to try to come up with some ways to help leaders get the feedback they need. Uh, one of the ways that we're helping leaders is through our virtual coaching process. And I like to describe our virtual coaching process today as a, a combination of what I would call the tried and true and the current and new. From a tried and true perspective, uh, we've been working with leaders uh, for decades, and Nellie pointed that out early on. We've collected leadership data on over 25,000 leaders around the globe. And so we know a lot about what makes leaders effective and how leaders can have impact in their organization. So kind of the tried and true. Uh, but as Valerie noted, we've also learned a lot just in the last six, seven months about what people need today. And for people who haven't worked in a complete uh, or even partial virtual environment, what are some of the things that they need? Uh, so through our virtual coaching process, we try to incorporate both the tried and true as well as some of the current and new that we've been learning. And 
just to give you a little bit more about the coaching uh, work that we do, uh, some of you may be familiar with our Leadership 360. Uh, that is one of the tools that we often incorporate into our virtual coaching process. Good news is because it's virtual coaching, it can be delivered anytime, anywhere in the world. Uh, our 360 assessment uh, is, is a data-driven approach. It's administered online. So again, it doesn't require any face-to-face -face interaction to set that up, execute it. Uh, it generates feedback based on our model, our model of high performance. So again, it's designed to give leaders uh, good feedback in areas that have real impact. Uh, we can provide personal support from expert coaches, again, across the globe. Uh, like everyone, we're using Zoom, we're using Teams and a wide range of technologies so that we can both build the relationship with the people that we're coaching as well as build the skills and behaviors that are impactful and relevant today. And, you know, this is a process that can be used with individuals, teams, and broader populations of leaders. And just for an example, uh, you know, there's one organization where we've worked over the last year and a half and did coaching with close to a thousand leaders. About 60% of those leaders uh, we engaged with in a virtual way. So all of this work was done in a you know, low touch, no touch type uh, environment. So uh, those are some of the benefits that we think about when we think about the uh, virtual coaching process that we can provide. I also wanted to take this opportunity to share something new um, that we've developed. So another way to respond to this need for feedback, and it's something that takes some of our work in the leadership space uh, and tries to build a bridge between culture and leadership. And it's something that we just developed. We're just now starting to employ it with some of the organizations that we work with. It's called our Leadership Effectiveness Index. So let me share a little bit about that because even people who are familiar with Denison and familiar with the work that we do may not be uh, familiar yet with this particular index. So the Leadership Effectiveness Index, as you'll see here, uh, is, is really intended to combine culture data and leadership data simultaneously. So what we've done is taken some of the items from our those uh, Leadership 360 and some of the information that allows us to see where leaders are deemed to be more effective. And we created a, a smaller survey that we'll show you an example of that in just a minute, but I wanted to give you a little bit of context for this in terms of how we developed it. So again, we took items from our Leadership 360. We were looking at those items that tend to be the highest predictors of effectiveness. We were looking for items that uh, supplement some of the information you might get through the cultural data that we collect. We were looking at items that were actionable and again, that we thought were relevant to some of the challenges that leaders are facing today. And we, we pulled that together to create this leadership effectiveness index. Uh, on the next slide here, what you're going to see is an example of what that looks like. Uh, so you'll actually see what uh, a report would look like if uh, you included this leadership effectiveness index along with the cultural data that you're already collecting. And you know, for those of you who are familiar with Denison, this will look pretty familiar. It's based on our four key cultural traits and leadership traits around mission, consistency, involvement, adaptability. You'll see scoring there that represents the ability to benchmark and see uh, how leaders are doing relative to other leaders and other organizations. I, I mentioned that all of these items were pulled from our Leadership 360 assessment. So the good news is we have that data for over 25,000 leaders, and that allows us to immediately start being able to benchmark feedback around leadership effectiveness 
against a, a very robust uh, leader database. And so this gives you an idea of the kind of report that you would receive if you uh, captured the leadership effectiveness uh, information. And what we'll look at next is I wanted to drive home the relationship between some of the leadership effectiveness items that we're capturing here and the areas that we know have been traditionally uh, important in virtual work settings. So as, as we look to the next uh, slide here, what you'll see are some of the key challenges that we've heard people talking about in a virtual environment. And some of those challenges have to do with goal setting. Some of those challenges have to do with setting clear performance standards and expectations. And if you look across to the right to some of the items from our leadership effectiveness index, you'll see references to goal setting, clear objectives, high standards of performance. We also know that some of the leadership challenges today that Valerie alluded to were around building trust, resolving conflict, facilitating coordination. So again, if you look to the right under the consistency area, you'll see references to things like building confidence and trust, helping people reach agreement, work through some of those conflicts, as well as facilitating coordination. Uh, a lot of emphasis today on how to build team cohesion, engage people, coach others uh, in this virtual environment, looking to the right at involvement, building effective teams, coaching others, creating that environment where people feel like they can contribute and make a difference. And then there's a set of challenges that leaders face around modeling change, creating that psychologically safe work environment that again, Valerie was emphasizing towards the end of her talk. And also making sure that as we're trying to sort out how we work together internally, we're also remembering that we have customers and stakeholders that we need to serve. And so under the adaptability area, we pulled forward some items that uh, talk about, are we looking, continuing to look for those new and better ways to work? How are we dealing with failures and mistakes that will inevitably occur as we change the, the work environment that we're working in? And are we continually improving our service to customers? So we think that this leadership index uh, leverages what we know to be some of the tried and true uh, capabilities, skills, behaviors that leaders need to have, but also uh, very relevant to some of the challenges that people are presented with in this virtual environment. So we're excited about it. Uh, anyone who's uh, about to do any kind of cultural work, uh, thinking about leadership work, this really is a rare and I think um, uh, exciting opportunity now going forward for us to be able to give organizations culture data and leadership data simultaneously. And then there's one last thing that I'll share before we turn it back over to Nelly here, and that has to do with another uh, new assessment that we're developing and have developed. It's ready to go as we speak as well. And this is around digital culture. And so what you'll see here is a model that talks about digital strategy, the people, the customer experience, innovative product design, production and delivery infrastructure. We know that uh, a lot of organizations have been wrestling with thinking about their digital strategy and some strategic uh, initiatives around digitalization. We know some of those priorities and initiatives have uh, needed to been expedited because of some of the challenges in the last four, five, six months. And the timing uh, was good because we had already begun the development of uh, a way to help leaders and organizations understand how well prepared their organization is to execute on a digital strategy. And so coming soon, in one of our upcoming uh, webinars, you'll hear more about this particular model, how we assess it, and how that can help inform some uh, important digital conversations in the organizations today. And so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn things back over to uh, Nelly for a couple of updates and also give us a chance to respond to some of the questions you have. 
Awesome. Thank you both. Um, before we hop into the Q&A session, I'd like to answer a recurring household question. Yes, a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be available. Um, we hope to have the recording ready in the next few days and we'll send it out to all participants. I'd also, like Brian mentioned, <clears throat> like to share some of our upcoming events and resources, which you'll be hearing more about from us via email and social media in the coming weeks. First is the publication of one to two transform research articles related to our ongoing digital culture campaign. Next, we have two upcoming certification workshops. Denison Consulting Europe is hosting a workshop in September and Denison US is hosting one in late October. Third, uh, as Brian just spoke about, our new digitalization model will be available soon. So look for some more information regarding that coming as soon as we can get it out. And last, Denison US is, part, uh, is continuing our partner webinar series in September. Like I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out um, an update about these upcoming events and resources in the near future. But in the meantime, please feel free to contact me or any of the Denison team to learn more about any of our offerings. So I had a lot of really great questions um, and I tried to break them down into, you know, some, some tangible responses that I could give to Brian and Valerie. Um, so I'm gonna direct some of my questions at either Valerie or Brian, but either of you are welcome to chime in as you see fit. Um, if I didn't get the right person in, in my uh, directing. Um, so first up, um, this was, I, I think, for Valerie, but like I said, Brian, chime in as you would like. Um, have you found any industries to be more successful in leading throughout the pandemic, i.e. some businesses um, that already led their organizations remotely like technology companies? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, what comes to mind for me is some of the universities that, that we work with. You know, I, many of them kind of already implemented a work from home strategy and, and upgraded their technology in preparation. Um, obviously, they didn't know the pandemic was coming, but they were already doing that to try to create more of a virtual online um, offering to students. So that comes to mind, Brian, any other industries from, from your perspective? But I think um, that's what came to mind for me. Yeah, I, from, from what I've seen, it, it's, it's perhaps a little less industry specific. Uh, you know, there are uh, a lot of people sometimes assume technology companies are, uh, you know, have been working in a virtual environment for a long time. And quite frankly, there's a lot of technology companies, some very well-known organizations who lean very heavily and have relied very heavily on the face-to-face -face because they think that's where the creativity and synergies come from. So I wouldn't say it's industry specific. A couple of things I have noticed is that uh, some organizations uh, were relatively well prepared in that they had a segment or a certain part of their population that was already, you know, doing work remotely and they could look and see how that was set up from a technology perspective and any policies, procedures, et cetera, that they've had to create uh, to make that work. Even in those cases, I think a lot of them were still pretty challenged when it became everybody going into a more uh, virtual work environment. And, um, and we've certainly seen some organizations who have been working at trying to transition to more of a virtual uh, workplace for a number of years, who again, had a lot of the foundational elements in place, but then had to really expedite that almost uh, literally overnight for some of the organizations. Uh, you know, one, one in particular that I can think of an organization where I was talking to the leaders and they said, you know, literally on a Thursday afternoon, they just told everybody to take their laptops home with them and be prepared to work from home the next day. Uh, so less than 24 hours notice. Uh, but it, it, it did vary quite a bit across the different industries in terms of how well they were prepared and how well um, they responded. Yeah, for sure. 
I think that this one is um, also directed for Valerie. Um, how can leaders model or encourage work-life balance, especially when they are so preoccupied with keeping their organizations afloat and may not be able to dedicate the proper amount of time to self-care? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's one particular answer for that. I, I, I think, you know, what I have found and coached leaders is to really just have that open dialogue. It, it starts with just awareness and, you know, kind of building the trust with the, the employees and, and letting them know it may be work-life balance is a struggle for you and just being authentic and, and honest and, and, and talking to them and getting their ideas of what could that look like or what do you need to see from me that would allow you to or feel that I'm modeling work-life balance. So I think, you know, I think that openness, you know, and, and really just having the dialogue with each other. And, and when it is a struggle, I, I myself struggle with work-life balance. I love what I do. <laughs> so sometimes it's hard to turn it off. And so I have to be cognizant when I'm sending out emails to my colleagues at, you know, late in the evening that I, I talk to them about that. And I say, that, hey, I still have my energy. I, that's when I think my at my best, but that doesn't mean I expect a response um, um, in the evening. So I think setting some boundaries, talking through, um, and just really sharing what it looks like to you and, and how can you support uh, them in trying to create that work-life balance. So I think Meredith touched on it's both what the organization can do, but it's also a lot largely falls on the individual and kind of creating that um, as well. I hope that answered their question. I think so, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> Brian, <laughs> in reference to the leadership effectiveness index, are we working on a similar index or are we thinking about working on a similar index that builds a bridge between culture and digital transformation? We are. In, in fact, that last piece that I uh, mentioned, the digitalization module that we've developed, uh, is the result of a lot of work over the last so oh, probably six to eight months. Uh, Dan Dennis and our founder has been actively involved in that. Uh, our research team and others to first understand you know, the implications of digitalization and what it takes to you know, really implement a, a robust digital strategy in an organization. And that was what drove that model that we shared at the end there. And associated with that model is a module that has survey items associated with all of those components. And that combined with cultural data, I think will give organizations really good insight about where they are relative to uh, implementing the digital strategy as well as how well their culture is uh, prepared to support that strategy. Um, this is, I think, for both of you, so whichever one of you would like to answer. In our research on work from home and leadership, working from home and leadership, have we identified any new opportunities that work for home, working from home opened up for leaders or any su surprise upsides from working from home from a leadership perspective? A couple, I mean, I'll share a couple and then let Valerie jump in as well. You know, I think one, you know, when I started my piece and said that there's actually a fair amount of data to suggest that sometimes, you know, remote leaders uh, are viewed as more competent, more effective. And, uh, you know, that, that was a curious uh, finding for me to, to think that, uh, leaders who are not physically present with with their uh, colleagues um, not that i necessarily thought that they were less effective but to to see that they were viewed as being in many cases more competent more effective i think is is should be something that makes leaders who feel like they're kind of operating in a space they're unfamiliar with 
that actually uh, you can do this and you can do this in a very competent uh, way. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing that's really been interesting in all of this is we feel like in some respects we're losing some social connection with some of the people that we work with. Uh, and so much of that is driven by kind of what you were accustomed to and what you were used to. So I'll use myself as an example. Uh, live in California, all of uh, my colleagues for the most part are in Michigan with a couple of exceptions. And I know for our people in our office who were used to coming in and seeing each other every day, there's a sense of perhaps less social connected than what they had before. For me, being someone who only got to interact with people every month or every other month, but now through this virtual connection, I feel a much stronger connection to most of the employees that, that we work with and that I work with. Um, Nellie is a great example of someone who was onboarded in a virtual way. Uh, and yet, you know, I think from day one, we established a good rapport and working relationship uh, that maybe would have taken a much longer time for me to develop uh, and for us to develop uh, had we been more reliant on face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, I would echo all of that, Brian. I think the other thing I've been hearing from leaders is that people are really stepping up and really getting involved, even more so in the virtual environment. And I apologize, my dog. <laughs> right on cue as far as virtual Hello. working. <laughs> but I do think there is that uh, everything that Brian mentioned, I would echo, and, and as well as the enthusiasm and that, you know, just people are stepping up and wanting to be involved. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, what we just heard there is kind of a perfect example of also getting to know and uh, connect with people at a different level. I think most of us have actually, uh, over the last few months, enjoyed the sound of dogs barking in the background or children, uh, you know, talking, crying, whatever they're doing in the background. It's, it's given us an opportunity to get some insight into the personal lives of our colleagues, which then also makes it much easier to do some of what Valerie was talking about earlier, which is from a work-life balance perspective, it gives us an opportunity to both appreciate what people are uh, up against in, and working through in their home life, gives us an opportunity to uh, contract them with each other to say during this period of time I really need to you know be doing X and and for leaders to be able to say it's okay it's okay that you have these other responsibilities and let's just you know, work together to come up with some agreements about how we're going to get the work done mm -hmm. all right since we're almost at the top of the hour I think um, we're probably gonna not answer any more questions in our live session, but for those of you whose questions we didn't get to get to today, we will do our best to answer them either directly or in the form of a Q&A resource that will be sent out as soon as possible. Um, and that concludes today's presentation. I'd like to give a special thanks to Valerie and Brian for their insights and time, and to each of you who took some time out of your day to join us. Uh, we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you all for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the time. Stay safe. Exactly. <laughs>